fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Why is this way on FM Los Angeles? 102.3 FM Riverside. And 1050 AM Palm Springs. Well, welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren. Dollar Store Dave is here. <laughs> Once again. Once again. It's all exciting, and uh, we've got a yes. returning guest, a couple of returning guests, beating them off with sticks. They're coming back for more. Wow. Yeah, I know. Uh, we've got a 25th anniversary edition of Death Drives a Semi, and the author is Ado Van Belkem, who's been on before with his wolf, wolf pack, so thank you for being here. Ado? I'm glad to be here, Alan. I'll be here anytime you want. And we've got Mr. Mark Leslie, who's the publisher, so welcome, Mark. Uh, thank you, publisher and, and perhaps number one fan, but not in a creepy sort of misery way. Well, <laughs> you're the I one. I mean, that could be injuring. Yeah, that, he's, yeah don't, don't tell him where you live. <laughs> Just, you know, kind of make it up. Give him Dave's address. Yes. Right? And he'll show up there with <laughs> I don't. Hand. I don't want to be hobbled. Too late. Yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> Nothing like a good leg beating. You know. Yeah. Um, okay. So before we get going on this, so um, Ado, this is an original book that you had written and released years years ago. Correct. So why the re-release and what's different about it? Okay. So this book originally uh, was published in 1998 uh, to uh, good. Uh, reviews and acclaim. It was a finalist for the uh, Bram Stoker Award in the Best Collection category. At the time, it was published by Quarry Press, which was a literary publisher in Kingston, Ontario. But um, it went through uh, a couple of printings, one for the American market after the first printing in Canada uh, ran through. And uh, by all accounts, it was a success. And um, it's a very important book to me because although I've done lots of novels, uh, my first love was writing short stories, short stories in the vein of Ray Bradbury, Robert Blocks, and so on. And I always wanted to produce a book like this, my favorite book of all time being The October Country. And I wanted to write a book like that with 20 short stories, all my best work, so everyone, someone could read it and finish a story and just go, wow, you know, that was great, and read the next one and the next one and have that same feeling every time they read a story. And... If I can say myself, I think I accomplished that. And speaking with Mark after the Wolfpack uh, thing took off on Paramount Plus, we did a podcast, and afterwards he suggested that he might be interested in doing a twenty fifth uh, a reissue of the book. It wasn't actually twenty fifth anniversary. That's just a happy coincidence. And I said I'd think about it. I really wasn't interested at the time, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought that would be so cool. We could do that and. I think it's a good enough book to merit that. I mean, it's just not, hey, I've got backlist books. You want to publish, please? It's uh, a book that I think has stood the test of time, and uh, he wanted to do it. He has the passion for the book that I do, so that's how it arrived. I mean, we're both looking at this book as something worthwhile. Mark, so what was it about this book that uh, was, was attractive to you that you wanted to get it out there again? Well, I, uh, I've been a bookseller my entire life, and, and I was managing a uh, Chapters, which is a big box um, um, chain <laughs> here in Canada, kind of like Barnes & Noble. And I remember having Ado come. I went to his book launch, of course, and I had him come into, uh, oh, actually various stores that I managed over the years Correct. to do readings. And In Death Drives a Semi is one of the best short story collections I've ever read. Now, it's it's kind of like my the October Country. A lot of writers, and, and I'm a writer myself, a lot of writers will say, you know, I read The October Country and I wanted to do something that awesome. And so I I read and reread Death Drives a Semi. I saw Edo perform, and he's so great at doing live readings, perform these stories. As a bookseller, I was constantly hand-selling this book to customers, looking for great short stories, great, you know, uh, deep, dark 
uh, macabre tales that are entertaining. And so I kind of miss, this is sort of a selfish thing, I miss being able to put the book in people's hands because it's been out of print for a number of years. And so I was like, oh, wow, cool. Wouldn't it be cool if we could bring it back into print? And because I do, you know, I've gotten involved in in publishing some of my own titles uh, through Stark Publishing as well as working with publishers, I thought, well, you know what? Why don't we why don't we re-release this book so so that other people, other writers, and other readers can then benefit from and enjoy these tales? And and I have to say, Alan and Dave, as I was going through, because I mean, we had to go back to old school, and there were like scans of of typewritten manuscripts and stuff like that. So formatting and putting the books together. I really got in and, and, and reread all the stories in more detail than ever before. And I can tell you, they not only stand the test of time, but they're phenomenal tales. I'm so excited to be able to just, you know, put a copy in someone's hands and go, you're looking for something great to read this Halloween? You're looking for a great gift this, this Christmas? This is a fantastic book for you. Right. You know, uh, so, so Ado, did you do anything different with the stories? Did you do any updates, or are they exactly as you did them originally? They're exactly the way I wrote them originally. I read through the book again, and the thing that struck me is, you know, you, sometimes you read stories that are 25 years old, and you think, wow, that didn't age very well. But reading through them, I thought they all stood up. They all remained kind of timeless, and I, I was quite proud of that. There was a couple stories, there was one or two things I thought, eh, that's big, too big a number and this should change. And then I thought, nope, let's go through it. Um, I think it's cheating to go back and fix it up. This is when I was writing and I was hungry and eager and laser focused and all of that, and to change it now being, you know, older, maybe wiser and everything. Maybe I'll lose some of that edge. The only thing I did is I added things. I added a, a, an additional story to be more like them, which I'm very proud of. I think it's one of the best I've written in terms of technique and structure and, and characterization and suspense and everything like that. And so we did that. We added story notes about how each of the stories was created, which you would think, oh, yeah, you just wrote that story. But each one had a kind of genesis that was different from the next one. And I always find those things interesting. In fact, you know, I would sometimes get story collections just to read the notes to see how other people did things. So there was that. Then I added um, an introduction to the overall book, which uh, I was pleased, uh, happy to do. And we also, uh, some, there's a one thing that's very unique. There's a, I recreated the author's photo. In 1998, I sat inside a tractor trailer unit you know, hung out the window trying to look as cool as I could, and we snapped the picture, and that was the author's photo for the book, and uh, recreated that, you know, got almost no hair on top, big, long, white beard, you know, a bit of wrinkles here and there, and uh, reproduced it, and both are included in the book. You know, things change over time. The stories haven't changed, but the authors changed quite a bit. Well, well, most of these stories were published originally in, in the 90s. Um, you know, I know back then, you know, I was just trying my hand at uh, submitting to uh, some markets back then. What, what was it like to submit stories uh, during that time? What, what was your experience? You know, the mailman was your best friend <laughs> because every day you're waiting for that mail to see what ha happened. I used to give a talk on uh, for writers called Thriving on Rejection. And I would talk about the whole submitting and the rejection process. You know, in the early years, I would sell a story or two and get rejected 35 times or so. And that continued for a number of years until the ratio was more like 50-50. And, uh, you know, you'd, I'd be scouring places for some place to publish the story and then submit and get something back or work on it again. And it was all by mail. And there was, you know, rotating submissions that uh, you would submit something and say, if I don't hear back from you in three weeks, I'm going to send it somewhere else. There was a whole etiquette involved. I don't know how it works now with the online stuff, but it was a chore. You know, you spent a lot on postage. You spent a lot on printing up manuscript pages, a lot of um, 
U.S. mail to get the responses back into Canada. You know, it was, uh, I had a great time doing it. And, you know, there were a lot of places that were publishing, not a lot of places that were professional markets. And I was surprised reading through the book, you know, reading this story and saying, you know, that story, that's really good. And then I looked where it was published and it was like something I, you know, it didn't, doesn't exist anymore. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, these places, I was publishing all over the place. And, um, it's great that the, they all came together, but, you know, it's a snapshot in time of the way things were back then. Now, you know, people can self-publish and they can go online and you can make a submission in one day and get, get it back by email the next and send it off again. So it was uh, it was pretty unique. And, and as I said, the mailman, best friend. You're like opening the, the mailbox three or four times in the afternoon. Is he here yet? Is he here? Yeah. Right. <laughs> and it was fun. I, I had a great time doing it. What, so what what was your uh, primary inspiration when you did the book originally? Um, it, it was, was there, each one of these stories had you, like I said, you did story notes, so there is some sort of story behind it. Um, but to do a whole book like this, did you have some sort of mindset, something you wanted to accomplish? Well, I wanted to accomplish... Um, creating a book like The October Country by Ray Bradbury. 20 short stories. It's the the book that I read that made me think, this is the kind of writer I want to write, uh, be. Someone who writes these kind of stories, and hopefully I can get the same response from other people that I had reading those. So that's what I set out to do, and it was a, a learning process. For many years, I was a devout student of the written word, short stories, I would read all kinds of fiction. But not only that, I would read books about writing fiction, learning and, and absorbing everything. And I would learn, read good stuff and really oh good my. stuff too. Because I could learn what not to do by reading a really bad story. Oh, that sucks. Don't do that. Men mental note. And then you find something that really works. It's that, ah, that's how this kind of story should end. This is how you do it. Thank you very much. And I, you know, just absorbed all of that in trying every different story, a different style and, and technique and things like that. And when I had maybe published 50 or 60 stories that were good enough to be considered, I sent them all to the publisher, and they chose these 20. Uh, some are obvious choices. Some are a little bit more eclectic. But... Uh, I had to know that I had to have 20 top-notch stories. You know, there's no filler in there. There's no, ah, uh, this one will take up some space. We'll make 20 stories. They're all worthy of being included. And I wouldn't do a book that uh, that just had, you know, a couple of good stories and the rest were filler. This had to be all top-notch, and, I, you know, the result is there. Yeah, yeah, you know, it, it. yeah, that's what my books are good for. You read them and you know what not to do. <laughs> uh, that's you know I'm proud of that. Hey, listen, Mark. What was the was there one inspirational story in this book, or one that kind of sticks out that you still think about, or still it still influences what you write yourself? You know, I think uh, that's a that's a difficult question. That's kind of like asking. I only have one child, but asking your favorite child <laughs> because. <laughs> I can, for different reasons, I can point out different stories. Like, these are my favorite ones to to listen to Edo do perform live. These are, are ones that, um, you know, uh, that, that teach me a particular uh, a twist, or these are, are ones where I can learn as a writer. But I think um, the, the story End in Justice for Some was one of the ones that really stuck with me because – that was the only one that in the original publication of the story and in the original Death Drives a Semi, there was a post-story note from Edo on the inspiration for that story about a superhero uh, who, who runs into uh, a, 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 an issue that unfortunately happens to, to too many people. And 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 I, I that stuck with me in a way that when I was wanting to bring this book back into print and pay homage to the original I thought, wouldn't it be cool? I'd love to know. I mean, I, again, it's all it's all selfishness. I want to know the story behind the story. Now, I've heard Edo talk about that at book launches and events and things like that. But wouldn't it be great if every story had a had had that? And 
and an updated note, of course, <laughs> for that story. Uh, Adio, maybe some of the some of the background on that story might might be interesting. Okay, so um, early '90s, my wife uh, had uh, a bout with cancer, and uh, I remember uh, I was at a writers' meeting one night. She said I went to the hospital because I wasn't feeling well, and they had a did a chest X-ray, and they found a fist-sized tumor in her chest, and ironically, it was the same day that. Uh, Mario Lemieux came out with his um, announcement that he had Hodgkin's disease, and they said he'd be playing in three weeks. So she took that as some comfort, and it turned out to be a Hodgkin's disease, and she was going to go for um, chemotherapy and then radiation, but when they did a biopsy in her chest, the surgeon nicked her aorta. So they had to rush her to Toronto General Hospital where they had a Thoracic team stand by on 24, hour, 24 hours a day. So they opened up her chest, repaired the aorta, closed it up again. She had to heal from that before she could even start all the other things. So I was in the hospital room with her while she was healing from that open heart biopsy, I call it. And uh, I had to, I wasn't writing or reading, you know, doing whatever. And my friend Rob Sawyer gave me this portable computer. And it's, at that time, it had a glass tube. It weighed about 35 pounds. But it was portable, and I set it up in the hospital room, and I started writing on it. And I wrote, a, because my wife was saying, you know, why me? I'd never done anything wrong. I never smoked. I never drank. I never did. Why did I get this? So I wrote a story about a superhero called Night Shadow who ends up getting shot for the first time in his career. And they patch him up, and they say, oh, this other thing. Uh, we took the x-ray, and there you have a uh, tumor in your chest. And you say, what? You know, I fight for good. And it just goes on like that for a, a bit. He's wondering, and you know, he's lived all his life doing good, and this is the reward he gets? So the, uh, the doctor who treats him is a little starstruck, and he says, can you sign something for my son? He's one of your biggest fans. And the superhero, Night Shadow, decides, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll sign it. And he gives them, the doctor gives him a pen, and he mentions this pen. Oh, this was uh, when I graduated med school, I was given this very special pen. So he's signing the autograph, and there's an emergency. The doctor's called away, so he signs it uh, to Billy, go to hell, Night Shadow. And then he takes the pen, and he puts it in his pocket, and he leaves the hospital. His first act of criminal, criminal activity. Now he's going to devote his life to crime rather than fighting crime if that's what he gets and you know it just it just i used everything that was going on in the hospital at the time with my wife some of the the room numbers and the code white and whatever everything they had and you know that's what i did i just took things out of my life and put them in stories and went on to the next one and um yeah well i'm glad that it affected mark so much but it was a fun story to write and uh yeah, every story has a story like that. There's not just one like, oh, I wrote a story and I submitted it and there it was. There's always some kind of genesis to it that's more than meets the eye. Well, look at Mark. Look what you did to him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, 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 yeah, you'd be happy. Are you, are, so how, how are you doing like now after Wolfpack and all that? Do you feel like, um, sort of like, um, re regenerated or do you, do you sort of feel like, um, Things are coming around in your writing world again? Yeah. I feel like, why didn't this happen 20 years ago? That's what I feel like. You know, why did it? Did I have to wait 16 years for, you know, something big like this to happen? If it happened 20 years ago, I would still be writing at a feverish pace and who knows what. But, uh, you know, it didn't. But having said that, this last couple of years have been the most fun I've had as a writer. I was able to feel like a rock star, you know, going to the premiere, showing up on set, and having all the actors be impressed to meet me, you know, the author. Oh, wow, this is so cool. And I'm like, okay, they're, they're young and naive, and they don't know yet, but I'll play along. Yes, it's a pleasure to meet you, too. Um, so I've been having a great time, and it's been a revitalization. The, the books have come out in audio form. The first uh, book is in print. There's plans for the ne the other three books to also come out in print, and I'm looking forward to that. If and when the season two is uh, to be announced, 
Jeff Davis, the show creator, has said multiple times that he wants me down for a cameo, which I can't wait to do. I hope I get killed, actually. <laughs> so I'll be on set one day, and the next day I'll have to get all the dead makeup and be on there again. That would be the coolest thing, right? And um, just having a blast. And, you know, the interest in Death Drives of Semi wouldn't have come from Mark had it not, you know, something tweaked to him about Wolfpack and that. So I'm grateful to it, and I'm having a blast. And um, it hasn't pushed me yet to start writing new stories and things like that. But who knows? It might. I'm just having a blast. I'm still the writer, and the writer is one of the lowest uh, spots on the totem pole. But uh, it's great to be where I'm at now, and I'm having a great time. Yeah, it's just pretty amazing how things change. You, so you didn't have to do any updates like, you know, cell phones or modernize any of your stories? I didn't put any in. Uh, well, um no, at that time, there were no cell phones, and um, there's a couple of other stories I know that I've done and mentioned, and at the time, it was like, oh, you had a cell phone, what luck, um, but, um, and I might have to change something like that. That's how these things get dated, really, when you use some kind of technology that's, you know, seems amazing at the time, and then becomes pretty uh, rudimentary uh, later on, but uh, I had to do nothing like that, and especially in the Wolfpack. They're out in the, the middle of nowhere, so there was no cell phones they were be able to use. Because probably wouldn't get any signals. Um, no, I did not have to update anything. I'm quite pleased with that, actually. I thought, well, what do I have to do? But um, there was none of that. No, it's, it's really good. It's, it's, it's amazing. So what, so what do you hope people get out of the book? I hope people just enjoy reading the stories. I hope they get a thrill when they get to the end. Maybe they might gasp, maybe they might feel sad, happy. Any one of the emotions is fine, as long as there is one. Whether they think uh, I'm the bee's knees or the bomb about writing that stuff, that's neither here nor there. It's what the stories are about. Hopefully they read the stories and you think, oh, man, that was so cool. You know, it's funny. I, there's a no, number of stories in there. There's a couple that are about uh, post-apocalyptic uh, zombie stories. And I did another novel, uh, Kilgorn Company, which was like published two years ago after 30 years. And I told people the stories about, oh, that's just like The Walking Dead. I said, yeah, it is, except I wrote it 20 years before The Walking Dead actually appeared on television. <laughs> so some people might say, oh, that's cool. That's like The Walking Dead, or this is like some television show I saw. Well, they were all written before all those things happened, so... Maybe they they might rethink how you know how wonderful their their shows are and you know good story writers uh, borrow from other ones great ones steal so you might be seeing some of the subject matter on certain shows who knows where the ideas came from but there is a chance that some of them came from my book. Well, well, I guess that, that kind of ties in with all the writer strike and the AI and all the stuff going on nowadays and where people get information and ideas from and how they create their their new stories, you know. So, Well, uh, if we delve into AI right now, we're going to be on here for a while. But uh, <laughs> as far as the writer strike goes, you know, I've, I've made jokes about that. First of all, Wolfpack's renewal has been delayed by first the writer's strike and now the actor's strike. And I often made the joke, you know, the pinnacle of my career as a writer, and I'm getting screwed over by other writers, you know, in terms of the strike, which is, you know, it's funny, but it's not, you know, hopefully the, the, they ratify the, uh, well, they should have ratified it by now, but hopefully they got everything they wanted and we can move forward, and, you know, the writers have the respect, the respectful place. And the same for the actors, you know. I uh, hope they hold out and get what they want, and um, they become valued by the, the studios, certainly. I don't think either one, either thing is going to benefit me, but as long as it's benefiting them, then uh, I'm all for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully it all works out and stuff. So, 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 what do you got planned next? Like, where wh where do you go from here? Are you just going to re-release some more books? You, you're still not interested in writing anything new yet. Um, well, I'll tell you this, Alan. Writing is very hard. It's the hardest thing, 
And when I was writing these stories, I was laser focused, absolutely, like a knife point. My entire life was focused on producing this. And when you get older and you like watching TV or watching the game, uh, having a few beers, you lose a little bit of that focus. I w I'll get back to it, I'm sure. But writing is hard. That's why being successful at it is even harder. Um, so what else I might do? I, I haven't told Mark this yet, but I'm hoping Death Drives the Semi is successful enough that he might be interested in doing a second book of other stories that have never been collected. But we'll leave that for another day. <laughs> I've been doing yeah. uh, YouTube uh, videos called the Wolfpack Facts, which is fun and maddening at the same time. Um, you know, I put them up on YouTube, and they've all got in the hundreds, and I'm still trying to figure out how to make the social media work where people actually pay attention to what the writer has to say, but it's a, it's a hard slog. And uh, past that, we do have the three other books in the Wolfpack series coming out, Lone Wolf, Cry Wolf, and Wolf Man. So there's that to look forward to. And there's foreign editions of that coming out in uh, Saudi Arabia, Chechia, and Italy. So who knows? If the series goes multiple seasons, there might be more of that. But uh, there's plenty on my plate as it is. Right, right. You said laser focus. So what is that the hard hard part of writing for you is, is the concentration and not having other things uh, you know, come into your mind, you know, like, you know, work or the phone or house or different things that are happened. Do you have to be sort of alone in a room then? Or is that is that the hardest part? Not so much that, but I had no other distractions. Now I'm doing all my hobbies. But back then I had none. My hobbies were my writing. When I wasn't writing something, I was driving the car, I was telling my wife about story ideas. I would have books yeah, I would wear cargo pants all the time, so I could have paperbacks in each pocket, uh, pant pocket. And if I had a moment to spare, I'd pull out a book and I would read, read from that book. And I would, you know, go through 30, 40 books a year quite easily. And it was all to make myself a better writer. And that kind of, you know, if you talk about being a professional baseball player, professional hockey player, you spend your off season working out, getting better, practicing, working out with coaches and things like that. I was my own coach, but that's the thing. You know, if you want a long career and you wanted to succeed when you got on the ice, you had to work at it all behind the scenes. And that's what I was doing. Um, it was not a, a wasted moment. It was all focused on, on the career and getting the, the work done and writing new stories. So, that's what I mean by that. Once, you know, distractions, I was a good procrastinator, make a cup of coffee, fold the laundry, you know, check my email, do all this to avoid the actual writing part. Because, as I said, writing is hard, and it's, you know, it's not fun. I, I, it became a profession and a job, and I, I did it. But it's, it's hard, and it's easier to do anything uh, other than that. So that's what I was doing. But laser focus, everything I was doing was you know, focused on becoming a better writer. That's what I mean by that. Well, Ado, you, you went from being like a fledgling author to like a full-fledged pro in like under two years. Yeah. Do you have a secret? that uh, Was there some... Uh... I'll tell you, that was, that did happen, and it was kind of unfair. I remember talking to Ellen Datlow, who did the year's best horror uh, anthologies, and at the back she would have all these honorable mentions, right? And I, saw, I met her at a convention or something. I said, Ellen, how come you've never chosen one of my stories, not even the Stoker Award winner, for an honorable mention in one of your books? She said, what? That's not true. And she looked and looked and said, oh, my God, you're right. And it was like, yeah, because I was doing professional stuff and everyone kind of overlooked it and he was doing, you know, all in, in these anthologies. And then... I remember talking to another writer saying, you know, gee, I wish I could get a chapbook published by somebody or, you know, a collection, because people were doing that all the time. And then the guy told me, oh, you're too successful. All your stories are in, like, major anthologies. And, uh, you know, and I'm thinking, are you kidding me? And so, yeah, there was some of that. And I don't know. Um, it's funny, because the first story I, I published, Baseball Memories, 
was in a literary magazine, and it was reprinted in Year's Best Horror Stories 20. And I'm like, I'll never live up to that again. And it took me a few years. They did another one that made it into Year's Best, a couple of stories. But the first one, it's like hitting a home run in your first major league at bat. And people think that, oh, yeah, you arrived full form, fully formed and everything like that. It took me, like, years to, to duplicate that, that thing because – you know, whatever was right that day, it all worked the same in tandem with each other, and it all came out right. But to do that again, it was hit and miss for a while, so I figured it out. So it's funny you say that, and looking back on it, yeah, that was the case. And I didn't have a magic formula. I had to figure it out. And luckily, I stuck with it because, you know, there would be an easy way to, to get discouraged by it. Oh, just that was a fluke. I'm not meant for this. But I guess it strengthen my resolve to do it again. Well, well, Mark, I was going to say, now I heard a rumor that Ado Van Belkham is interested in doing some of his other books. So what do you think? I think the world would benefit from more more of Ado's stories. He is a, an absolute master storyteller. He, this is going to benefit readers who get to who get to enjoy them, but also like me, and I've learned so much as a writer just from reading Ado's works. I, I mean, that would be that would be the bee's knees. It's good for you know. It's good for your show that Mark learns of this. But I, I'm going to see him tomorrow, and I did plan on mentioning it to him, but I wanted to see what how the reaction was to the first book, and you know, because it is a business. I mean, I've closed down plenty of uh, publishers and newspapers and things like that with my with my stories and actually had them closed down before they published my stories. So it is a business and you got to keep that in mind that it's not all about vanity and putting things out. It's about, you know, making a, getting a return on, on the investment. And Mark's been gracious about his investment of time. I don't know about money, but I'm sure there's some there and all of those things. So I have to respect that and, and you know, not, push my way in there but you know ask if it's possible and i'm going to keep it that respectful uh, thing and uh mark you're being a very kind gentleman at this point we'll talk tomorrow maybe oh uh, looking forward to, to talking over a beer where you're going to be doing some live readings at a brewery like two of my favorite things great great horror stories and beer i knew i would get you out if <laughs> i had it at a brewery so that was plan <laughs> a a and I don't know how many people are going to be there, but I know at least two. So we'll go from there. <laughs> yeah, and we'll we'll have some fun there. That'll be fun. But no, this is this is just so exciting because, like I said, it's it's a phenomenal book. Uh, I wanted to pay homage to the original edition. Even got a hold of the fonts, the original font that was used. The cover designer I worked with, I sent him images of the original cover and said we want to, want it to look like that, but better. Like you know, revise it, update it a little bit. We didn't put a cell phone in, in, in you know, in the driver's hands in the, yeah. <laughs> in the truck. But, but you know, so I was so excited uh, about people getting a chance to check this out, particularly, you know, uh, this, this time of year. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, so what do you think about, what is it that, um, about Ado's style in writing or technique, let's say, that um, you, you, you are so fascinated with or that you figure that readers – and writers can learn so much about. So there, there's a there's a genius to the writing in which it, it's it's invisible. And so as a reader, you just fall into the story. You fall into the dialogue. You fall into the descriptions, and you're just in the story. And that's not easy to do. So as a reader, you just enjoy it. But as a writer, you look at it and think. How did he do that? And so when you're reading the stories, you're inspired, just like, like I said, like so many horror and science fiction writers were inspired by Ray Bradbury's short stories. I'm, I know I'm not the only writer who is inspired by Ado's fiction. And just to look at, yeah, just, to, just, and again, that's one of the things you do as a writer, right? You're watching a television show or you're reading a book and you're thinking, oh, I wouldn't have done it that way. I would have done it another way. Or you learn from, Oh, I see how he tricked me here. Like I see, I see how he set up this twist. You know, when you think about some of the twists in the stories, and you're like, "Oh, that was genius!" Because th there's an allusion to it, and he hinted at it, like in like in a good mystery. But but then you know, pull the wool over your eyes anyway. 
Right, right. So, Ado, your your short stories. When you when you do short stories, um, what's your method, or how how do you make it so that the characters are really understood quite well in a very short time? Is there a particular trick to that? Well, you mentioned characters, and maybe it's a complaint about my novels, but characters. My characterizations are always, you know, three or four lines, and because. You say that uh, a novel is a marathon and a short story is a sprint. And I took that to heart. My short stories are sprints. What I do, I would keep a notebook by my bedside. And if I dream something, some idea, I always wrote it down because I don't know if anyone else has experienced this. But if you think of something in the night and you think, oh, that's so great, I'll remember it in the morning. You will not. It'll be gone. So just a couple of words to remind yourself, oh, yeah, yeah, that was it. that's important. And when I was writing stories, I always knew the ending first, uh, with some exceptions, the rug being one of them. But I usually knew the ending first and knew that I had to get there. So that sprint was from the beginning to the end, and let's go sprint as quickly as I can. No wasted space. Now, other, it's not for me to say what my style is, but others have said that it's lean and muscular, no wasted uh, words, all of those things. And I think that's what Mark is alluding to in part, because, you know, there's some authors you can read, and they'll just go on a three-page tangent about some thing, and by the time you get back to the story, you forgot what the story was about. Never with one of mine. There's always going to be a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um you, you know, you laugh at Mozart saying Salieri, oh, you should teach me how to put big bangs at the end of my store, of my music, so people will know they're over. And uh, Salieri says, well, I wouldn't presume Mozart. I never got what that means, but I, I get the gist of it. You know, you want people to know where they are in the story and never think that, oh, what the hell's going on in the story? Because once that happens, the writer has failed, not the reader. I always say that. I'm a smart guy. I've read a lot of books. If I ever get into a book or story saying, what the hell's going on, I put it down. I used to read all the way through it, but now I put it down because it's up to the writer to make me understand what's going on, and I don't have to you know, work that hard to figure it out. So no, no complaints about that in any of my stories. Lean, muscular, from point A to point B, here's the ending, pow, punch in the face. Right. I just wonder if there's certain points or characteristics about a character that you bring out in a story because the reader has to know who they're dealing with right away and fairly quickly. Oh, yes, obviously you've got to, what I'm saying is I get it down to two or three lines so that you get an idea what kind of character it is and then the reader will fill in the blanks what kind of character that is for them. But the you, the description of characters are universal. So if I'm using just a few words to describe it, they've got to be the right words, right? Not that something that means something to me and to nobody else. It has to be a, a meaning that's similar across the board and everyone knows what I'm talking about. You know, you'd be at a party and telling a story and you give some kind of description and everybody understands what you're saying. That's the goal. That's where you need to get to and. I think more often than not that I got that, but I can't say 100% because I'm not in the minds of all the readers. But characterization, sure, but it's got to be pinpoint, accurate, and understandable by the masses. Right, right. Did you um, do any of these stories after people you knew personally? There's plenty of people I know that are in there. Uh, as a matter of fact, Death Drives a Semi is about a reporter named Don Moore going from Cambridge to his home in Brampton. I worked for the Cambridge Reporter for a couple of years, and I had to drive on the 401 for an hour every day there, going there and going back. And Don Moore was an editor there. He was close to retirement, and he was a large man, if I could say overweight, and he was the perfect one for, you know, maybe having a heart attack on the highway, maybe not, I don't know. So I used his name, and I used all the descriptions that were apt to him. And some of the stories, I used the houses I was living in at the time. Uh, Anything I I could to make it 
more real. I, I decided early on, you know, I'm going to write all the stories about in terms of where I live. You know, why not? If Stephen King could make Maine sexy for horror, why not? I could make Brampton or I could make Canada the same way. And I decided to do that. So, and it's easier because you don't have to think of stuff. It's just, you just reach out and grab it. It's like low hanging fruit. Oh, I need a, a place. Well, here's the one I live in. Uh, kind of house. Uh, the one I'm living in is kind of good too. I know every nook and cranny. So yeah, a lot of people I know made their way in there. Maybe not the names, but the people I know, sure. Right. Yeah. Influence and stuff like that. So let's talk about what's going on with you guys. So it sounds like you've got some, uh, events planned and stuff. What's, what's, what's going on? Were you doing beer and reading? Yeah, so uh, one of the things I didn't even realize uh, that Ado and I were both fans of, of craft beer and uh, and purveyors of wanting to support those small businesses. And so uh, Ado has a connection uh, with um, Good Lot uh, Farm Brewing, uh, which is north of Toronto uh, in Ontario. And so Friday night, uh, Friday on October 20th, uh, from 7 to 8, uh, it's a free reading. So Ado's going to be there at the brewery. Uh, reading uh, some stories, telling some scary stories, just, you know, perfect for the Halloween season. Uh, I'll be there, of course, as his publisher. I'll have books on hand, so if people want to buy them, uh, they can uh, get signed copies, etc. And, and yeah, that we're looking forward to um, looking forward to that. And, and, again, I haven't seen Edo in person since uh, sort of the, 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 the Brampton uh, premiere of, of Wolfpack uh, that I brought my son to, and it was so exciting uh, because he he loves the TV show and he was so excited to get uh you know to to get assigned um a book uh from you uh as well so that was it was so much fun because I remember you know when I first met Uedo your son was was young was was a young man and and he was there with uh, Roberta and you at different events and and now he's a full grown man a professional doing really awesome creative things. And then I got to bring my son and say, well, here's, here's a guy, here's a writer who's been a mentor to me. Uh, you get to meet him now uh, as well. So that was a really great moment for me. Well, fantastic. So what's the social media and website and everything like that for you, Ado? Where, where do people find you? Well, I say to people, if you can't find me, you're not looking hard enough. <laughs> There's videos on YouTube. Just type in my name. I have a channel there. Uh, I'm on X. Uh, also formerly known as Twitter, Facebook, I have a page there, and Instagram, and, and a little bit of TikTok. I'm still sure trying to figure that out, but uh, I'm on there as well. And uh, I'm trying to put, I put out content, sometimes has to do with Wolfpack or Death Drives and Semi, sometimes not, but uh, I'm having fun learning it because I'm a middle-aged man. If you see me with the Santa Claus beard and all white and, and little hair up top, Social media is something that came far after my prime, so I'm learning how how it all works, and uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be on this show and other you know kind of podcasts and I'm learning my way there. So I do have a presence on social media, and hopefully people will check it out. Well, fantastic. Now we're going to have that up on our website along with the book and the links and everything like that so people can find it easily. So we really appreciate you being on the show. What's coming up for you next, Mark? Uh, I'm uh, still writing. Um, the next book in my uh, Canadian Werewolf series is Only Monsters in the Building, which comes out in March of 2024. So when I'm not um, cheerleading other writers, I'm, I'm hard at work on some of my own fiction. Well, we appreciate you both being on the show. And, of course, the uh, the book is called Death Drives a Semi, and it's 25th anniversary edition. Ado Van Belkin, thank you for being here, and Mark Leslie as well. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, David. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Something with media. I'll be back.